presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, he led the legal team that bankrupted the Aryan Nations in Idaho. A conversation with attorney Morris Deese, the founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center, about the legacy of that case and the human rights issues still on the docket. That's Dialogue Next. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. On September 7, 2000, a North Idaho jury found Aryan Nations leader Richard Butler and his associate Michael Teague negligent for not supervising two guards who shot at and assaulted Jason and Victoria Keenan. The jury awarded the Keenans $6.3 million in damages. But since neither man nor the Aryan Nations had that much money, the judgment bankrupted the group. Idaho philanthropist Greg Carr would go on to purchase their compound and destroy it. It was the culmination of a 20-year fight by Idahoans against the Aryan Nations, a neo-Nazi group whose members had committed murders, <coughs> robberies, and bombings in its quest to make the Northwest whites only. Now, the leader of the legal team that represented the Keenans in their civil suit joins me now to discuss the legacy of the case. Morris Deese is the founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama. Since 1971, the center has worked on civil rights issues, including tracking hate groups and representing clients whose rights have been violated. The center also provides educational materials to teachers all over the country through its Teaching Tolerance Program, and two of its short films have won Academy Awards. In 2012, the American Bar Association gave Mr. Deese its highest award, the ABA Medal. Now, Mr. Deese is in Boise and Moscow as the annual Bellwood Lecturer for the University of Idaho's College of Law. Welcome. I'm glad to be here, Marcia. It's been 14 years, and I'm so well, glad I to think, be back. Well, I think, yeah, 2001 is when we last talked, May 2001. Well, so it'll be 12 years. 12 years. Yeah, we don't want to add any more years right. to, our, <laughs> to right. ourselves either, right? But in many ways, the world has really changed. Wow, that was before September 11th. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But first, as I mentioned in the introduction, I want to talk a little bit now, more than a decade later, after the, the verdict in the Aryan Nations case, about the legacy of that case and how you see it. And first, I'd like to run a clip of you right after that verdict was announced, as well as uh, some comments from Mr. But Butler and Michael Teague. We intend to take every single asset from the Aryan Nations now and forever and hopefully close that sad chapter in this history of this nation. I guess all I can say is, you know, justice has prevailed and yes, we have won. So this is nothing. We have planted seeds. Most of North Idaho now is filled with the people who escaped multiculturalism or diversity. You can shut down Aryan Nations, you can't stop the message. You can't stop our hearts, you can't stop our minds. It's never gonna happen. Well, there's a lot in that clip right there, <laughs> but first of all, describe that uh, day. Well, it was a, a proud day for our legal team, and, but I think more for our clients who had suffered. Uh, it looked like they were not gonna get a, a trial. In fact, wasn't even gonna arrest the people that, that beat them up until finally the uh, prosecutors decided to go after those that had beaten them up on the streets, and they were pretty well-known people. They knew who they were. They just escaped the state and left. And uh, But more importantly, it was a proud day because not only did the jury render a verdict, a civil verdict, against those who actually did the assault, but they reached beyond them to the to the people that were pulling the strings, Teague and one of the leaders and, and Richard Butler. And f once and for all, he was found guilty almost as if he had actually beat them up himself. Yes, negligent for not supervising the guards. And as I mentioned, uh, Greg <clears throat> Carr and Idahoan would go on to purchase the compound and it was raised, it was burnt. Um, you had mentioned at that same speech that you were going to not only take all the assets, but even take the name Aryan Nations. Right. That hasn't happened <clears throat> because people are still uh, <laughs> going around saying, you know, I'm the leader of the Aryan Nations. So what well, happened there? Well, first of all, you know, when you win a case, you think, gosh, we're going to put them out of business, which we did. They, they bankrupted, and uh, not only did we take the compound over and person bought it, a wealthy person bought it, and the money went to my clients, 
and the compound was made into a peace park, which is a, a quite a piece of justice itself. And, and the, the, as far as taking the name, you know, y you can name anything you want to. Uh, I just felt like we wanted to bury the name forever. And if it was owned by our clients, not Southern Poverty Law Center, they could control who used it. But the fact of it is, uh, you can use a name. Uh, there's no Aryan Nations, there's no organization that exists today in America. There may be some individuals, I'm the Aryan Nations, like I'm Adolf Hitler, I'm the National Socialist Movement, but it's meaningless. So, you know, just uh, nothing to worry about. So, yeah, it was a little bit of a, an overreach on the name, but people are using it. There's people who go around and say, I'm the leader of the Aryan Nations now. Do you think it, it's, it's truly dead? Well, you say dead, you, you know, people have free speech rights and you can claim you're Adolf Hitler's son if you want to. But I mean, do you think the group is viable? Oh, the is, group is, is all viable? Clearly, clearly gone. Yeah. It's just probably one person in a, I would say a post office box today, it may be one person in a website. That's uh, what we want to talk about next. You know, as you heard uh, Richard Butler say and then Michael Teague, this is not the end for the Aryan Nations just because you're taking our compound and our assets. Uh, we can go to the internet. We can, we can, there's plenty of people out there who believe what we believe. What do you think, <clears> did, did the, the legacy of the case, clearly it bankrupted the Aryan Nations, but it, did it stop these hate groups? Did it send enough of a message, or are we still seeing a lot of the same hate groups around on the internet this time? Well, well first of all, it, it's kind of like a uh, military operation. You go up to command and control centers, and that's where they distribute their materials from. We, when we took the Aryan Nation compound, I went out there, and they have these printing presses and mail rooms, and, and they were sending their material physically all over the United States in prisons. The British wagon was part of their operation. So that part went down. Now, anybody can set up a website, and websites are effective. In fact, they are the virtual hate groups in America. There are probably six or 700 websites. You know, Timothy McVeigh was the poster child for websites. He got the recipe for the bomb he built to bomb the Oklahoma building from the website. It was uh, how to build a bomb. And so, so as far as stopping hate groups, no. They, actually, there are probably a thousand hate groups out there existing today. Since Obama was elected, they've increased double uh, in the so-called militia groups, these so-called patriot groups. There, there was about 150 when Obama came to power. Now there are about 1,500 plus of those. Uh, and, and there's a lot of anger towards our government, our president today, because he's an African-American president. But I think that the message that Butler was saying, that what he was trying to get across is, we've planted the seeds. Well, that may be true in many ways. Uh, it, it, I'm not sure people would listen to him when he planted the seeds, but this whole neo-Nazi skinhead group, Klan groups that were going on during that time, and groups that we really put out of business with major lawsuits, you can uh, look on the mainstream media and find that, that their ideas have become mainstreamed. I mean, I'm, and I won't put any, you know, I won't say that the people who are leading the, uh, uh, I don't call it, whatever you call it, not a filibuster in Congress today over this uh, budget uh, are necessarily racist or neo-Nazis, but the bottom line is you've got a very small group of Tea Party people and they're good people, and they're good reasons for people to not like our government, and Tea Party people are not all racist, but you take this little small group of people uh, trying to defund Obamacare, something that was voted on by Congress, something that was passed by the Supreme Court, but yet they don't, these people do not want poor people in America, mainly people of color, and a lot of them are people of color, a lot of them in Appalachia or not, they're white people, to have the benefits that the rest of us take for granted. So I think if Richard Butler was around today, he would be a Tea Party member, and he'd be pushing to defund Obamacare, and he'd be the one screaming against Obama. But all you have to do is look on some television stations. They've, they've mainstreamed the message. I won't mention the stations, but and then you've got radio talk show hosts that are out there like uh, so many of them are doing the same thing. Because the Tea Party uh, members say they're not racist. It sounds like you're associating the Tea Party members with some of these neo-Nazi groups. Yeah, well, you know, all you have to do is look at some of their signs, you know, let's get rid of this Marxist president. Well, I mean, you know, I don't know what you want to call that. And I'm not, as I said, every Tea Party person is not a racist or a neo-Nazi or anything like that. But, uh, and, and, and there are lots of reasons that we 
have to be angry at our government that's not fulfilling our promises, not just under Obama, but under the past 10 presidents. We got angry, reason to be angry with our government. But the message that's coming through from these people is we don't like these people who are different than us. Look at the Tea Party membership. And, and this changing demographics from America is frightening them. When I got out of law school, 15% of the American people were people of color. Today it's 36%, and in the last year, 2012, more babies of color were born than whites. And that's going to change. In the year 2030 or 40, you're going to see America become a nation. Idaho may not. Idaho is a you know, quite different demographics in the great Northwest. But you're going to see this changing, and that is frightening these people uh, in, in the country. So if hate groups have multiplied since President Obama was elected, um, what is the legacy of the Aryan uh, nation's verdict? I mean, it shut down that group, but <clears throat> it doesn't sound like it represented a turning point. Well, you're so right in, in, in one respect. We still have individuals who want to set up a little organization and uh, call it a hate group. But some of the hate groups today are not the, the ones that we put out of business. The well-organized groups like the, like the white Aryan resistance that killed some people in Portland, Tom Oregon. Metzger. Right, Metzger's group. The, uh, the Klan groups that were burning black churches, the United Klans of America that bombed the church. We've put all those groups out of business. There's not a major hate group today that, uh, that has chapters all over the nation that's threatening people's lives based on their color of skin. What we do have today, though, is a broader definition of hate groups. Uh, for example, like the Family Research Council is a group that's a really mild family-sounding name operates out of Mississippi and Washington, and they're, they're an anti-gay group. Now, it's okay to be anti-gay. Your church may be anti-gay. That's That'd make you a hate group because you don't believe that, that gays, people should exist or whatever. But but what the Family Research Council does is they demonize people, LB, the LBGT community. They say that gay men are more likely to be pedophiles, which is demonstrably false. They say that gay people promoted the Holy Cause, which is demonstrably false. They've got 10 or 12 things they say. And if you put that kind of rhetoric out, which isn't true against a group of people, it causes others to go out and, and cause them harm, to, to do violent acts against them. And that's your them. definition of a hate group is, is a group that's inciting uh, violence. Well, uh, what about, um, not just you know, violence, but uh, I don't think their Family Research Council is inciting violence. They're, they're demonizing a group with basically untruths. They take like Minister Farrakhan, of the, uh, the um, Nation of Islam, a very small Islamic group, a very small group of Muslims. Uh, they say that Jews are children of the devil, that Judaism is a gutter religion. Uh, that's, that's Farrakhan, 18 or 20,000 people in his group. We list that as a hate group because of, because of what he's saying against people. Now, you might not uh, like what he's saying, but what he's saying is, is, is that it encourages people to go out and harm those individuals because they demonize them being less than human. What do you think of former Idaho and Brian Fisher, who's with the, I believe he's with the American Family Association. Is that what you're talking about? The well, I don't know this okay. person, and I don't know the group that got a chapter out here. he's mentioned some on your, yeah. on your website. Going back to President Obama, did you see, think you'd see a black president elected in your lifetime, or was that a surprise to you, well, given the type of... Uh, groups that you track. Well, I was born in 1936 in a, <clears throat> in a total area of Jim Crow in the South and segregation. And when I grew up as a teenager, clearly I was raised on a small cotton farm. I believed in segregation because everybody else did. I began to change my views when I got to college and saw the violence against those who tried to integrate my school, and I began to quickly change. Uh, you know, I, I, no, I didn't think that you'd have somebody like Obama who would come out uh, the woodwork, so to speak, and and, uh, and and become president, but I but I would not be surprised though that at the end of this century we'd have a Latino president. And I feel quite sure we will, and when, because of the changing demographics. The changing demographics, changing demo, and also the, I think the younger people have become more open-minded. Had in 1865, I would have said on your program if they'd had television then, then I'm Irish and one of our Irish uh, kinsmen is going to become president Kennedy. of the United States. Let me tell you, I would have been booed off the stage and they'd probably bomb this station here. But he did. And I predict that you're going to have a Latino president uh, uh, that, that will be a president. I think the America will be 
greater for it like it's greater for the president we have now. It's hard to change and people don't like change and change, people are afraid of change. And that's really the underpinnings of the Richard Butlers of the world is that they, they don't like to see the change around them. They believe that America belongs to them. Uh, and they feel like that they're, they're the real America, these, these Anglo people that came here and carved it and took it away from the Native Americans, you know. So America's moving forward, always has. And I promise you, America's great because of our diversity and not in spite of it. You mentioned that hate groups have exploded since uh, President Obama was elected. Another thing that has happened since you and I last talked in May 2001 is September 11th, 2001. The effect of that attack on uh, human rights issues must, must have been dramatic because there were many who started anti-Islamic groups, for instance, that might not <coughs> have existed when you and I talked before. Well, first of all, let me say this, that I think President Bush, who was president at the time of 2011, did a great thing by having uh, at the National Cathedral uh, one of the prayers uh, for the 2011 victims, to th you know, to, I mean 2000 uh, uh, the, bombing, the victims, bombing victims, victims. Yeah. Uh, the prayer was led by an Islamic uh, minister, uh, and that was, I thought, imam. Was, it was a very, very good thing to do. And we did see people kill even Sikhs with headbands, Indians with a headpiece. Yeah. yeah, just shoot them because they thought they were, uh, the bias is so great they thought they had to be uh, some kind of terrorist, you know. And we've seen that. But I, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, you've clearly, clearly with uh, the, you know, the Taliban and the, the war in Afghanistan and Iraq and all these other places, that you, you have an increase in the amount of, of, of bias against Muslims in the United States. So that's one of the issues that you're following, Southern Poverty right, Law Center. Certainly. You mentioned uh, that LGBT issues are another right. uh, burgeoning human rights issue that you're following. Um, immigration yes. as well. Do you think immigration that's is, I think, the biggest issue? LGBT is, you know, we're not an LGBT rights organization, even though under our tolerance education program we have taken on some litigation. Uh, dealing with it. We filed a suit in Michelle Bachman's district, the Anoka Hennepin School District, where four students had, had committed suicide in the previous five years because the school board, that's the largest school board school district in Minnesota, uh, they, they had uh, uh, had a policy that we're not going to interfere and basically boys will be boys so don't act gay, you know, that kind of thing. Well, we ended up getting a large financial judgment for the families there and, and change the whole policy of the school. So we do kind of class systemic type lawsuits that will make a big change. And, and we see this is a, a very big issue with the Supreme Court. And immigration, Court. you mentioned. And immigration is one that we're really focusing on today. Uh, you had some states like Alabama, Arizona, North South Carolina, Georgia passed these draconian anti-immigration laws, basically set to run Latinos out. Well, the problem is uh, the Latinos in the Southeast I'm not sure about Idaho, but they're planting the pine trees. They're raising the vegetables for Del Monte and other companies. They're uh, doing all the landscaping work, framing, bricklaying. They, they're essential poultry processing, the biggest ones down there. And they can't get Americans to do the work, no matter what you pay them. It doesn't even matter. They don't want to do this work. They tried that. They tried to, you know, when they tried to shut the immigrants out, saying they couldn't even get public water unless they could pro show citizenship. But we, we filed suits against those cases. All those, the courts ruled that all those laws were illegal. They couldn't do it. It's a federal issue. And it, it's, a ma it's a major problem, but I, I think that, I think that uh, uh, the South is now seeing that these people, that man, they're less than 3% of our population, but they, don't, they, don't, they have no power, they don't vote, and they're treating them like they did the blacks when they had no power and no vote. I'd it's, be remiss if I didn't ask you about your reaction to the Trayvon Martin um, sure case, uh, you've said in, in testimony before Congress, you're not sure what a jury could have done otherwise with Florida's law and the way that the uh, Zimmerman was charged. Uh, but do you, do you see that as a, uh, a flashpoint that's going to continue to have effects down the line in our country? Well, I think, I think profiling and systemic built-in bias and prejudice is an issue. Uh, a lot of people misunderstand the Zimmerman case. It was not a case of stand your ground law. That was not the defense. It was self-defense. A defense has been used since English common law. And when the witness said that Trevor Martin was pounding the other guy on top of him, 
almost regardless of what had happened 30 minutes before, it's almost irrelevant. Now, this guy shouldn't have had a gun. Uh, community watch people are, are not supposed to have weapons. This is the, the rules that the Sheriff's Association, National Police Chief Associations have. They can't have weapons. They're supposed to simply have a flashlight or get on the phone and call the cops. Well, you know, clearly he was wrong, but when he got down to the issue, but the bottom line is, I mean, you'd have to be a pretty naive person to think that if my son or a, or a, a teenage white girl was walking around out there and, and he would have shined his flashlight on them and seen them and says, hey, what are you doing here? But there had been uh, a lot of break-ins in that area, pretty much by black males. They'd caught a few of them there. And, uh, and those are anecdotal things that are happening around the country. And consequently, uh, he just figured, like, I'm going to catch this guy. And that's what it, that's what it boils down to. You said uh, in a hearing before Congress on race relations that America is increasingly becoming armed and dangerous. What do you mean by that? Well, with the systemic bias and prejudice for profiling going on, and then with the increased number of guns people have, it, that's a recipe for disaster is what I was trying to get across. Uh, well, clearly, you know, when we had these various shootings in the schools and things, instead of having less guns, we have more guns. Because whether it's President Clinton who's trying to stop assault rifles from being proliferated around the country or Obama trying to, you know, at least have simple background checks on these gun sales that go on, there, there, there's the National Rifle Association frightens American people saying they're going to take your guns away, which is just bunk. But still, though, that people go out and they rush out and they buy guns. I have a friend that runs a gun store, and he says that uh, AK-47s and assault rifles price triple. People coming in buying three and four of them and 20 and 30 thousand rounds of ammunition, and it's going to sit in their closet and corrode because what are they going to do with it, you know? Last time you came here, I believe you came with uh, a state police officer. That's how high tensions were. Do you still need to be protected yourself as you go around since you're involved in these high-profile cases? You know, I, I think that uh, you have to be cautious. Uh, we've put uh, quite a number of people in prison and in jails and cases. I've been a federal prosecutor that put a bunch of guys in, in jail who were trying to steal explosives from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, to blow up a bus of black kids to start a race war. People think like that. And, uh, and there have been 33 people who've gone to jail for attempts to, they burned our building, they bombed it, they tried to, you know, hurt me. And so I'd be, I'd be remiss if I didn't have some protection. But I do think the great people of this wonderful state are not represented by the Richard Butlers of the world. They are such a small fragment of the population. And, and this, this is, I mean, I have no fear from anybody in this state doing anything to me. Well, let's talk about some of those other people. You know, um, we're increasingly seeing, and actually when you uh, worked on this case with the Aryan Nations, this happened too, people defect from groups. Most prominently recently was Derek Black. Um, his father runs Stormfront. Right. And he sent a, he, this young man who'd right. been involved in the movement for many years, 20-some uh, yeah. years, sent a letter to your organization sure. renouncing his hatred. Um, I know... For the Color of Conscience documentary that I did, I interviewed T.J. Leiden, another mm -hmm. former neo-Nazi. Right. Are we seeing more of this uh, going on? Well, I, I, I think we are seeing young people, uh, even though their parents might have tried to get them to go take a certain racist view or certain lifestyle view, that begin to think for themselves. Because you know, an older couple might see an interracial couple and say, wow, that bothers me, and they're, they're seven-year-old son or daughter might see nothing. It just, you know, times change. The uh, Stormfront has 250,000 registered members. That's not people who just go to the Stormfront like I might check it out. That's people who signed up to see it. So they have a lot of followers. And, uh, and uh, Don Black, who runs it, is married to David Duke's right. wife. And so David Duke's the big clansman. Ex-wife, right. Yeah. Ex-wife, right. So, so they keep it in the family down there. And so this, this, this son, Derek Black, from a little boy, had his own radio show. And he was Mr. Teenage Hate. And, and, you know, on his own, not anything. Maybe he read our material, I don't know. But he goes to a college down there and he meets other people. And he sees, wait a minute, uh, you know, th th what, what I've been taught in my life is, uh, is not realistic. It's not real. And he made this, he sent us, he sent us an email at the Southern Poverty Law Center. I guess he sees us as a place to get the message out. But saying that he apologized to all the people that he had demeaned. And uh, it was just the most unbelievable email 
like, like we'd written it ourselves. It's an amazing email. And his father now is sitting there. Well, I love my son, and uh, he's he's not buying this line that I'm pushing. And uh, and maybe Dad will think about it. And several members of the Gina Six, who were black youth who um, had assaulted a white person, are now uh, going to college and uh, yeah. hoping to better their lives as well. It seems in both instances, education was the denominator there for their yeah. change in views. Um, as we as we wrap up here. Foreign countries are seeing an increasing amount of hate groups. Do you do any work abroad? We're, we're pretty familiar with what's going on in Germany, in England, England, and France, and other countries where they, where they've had a lot of immigrants come in from different areas, Africa and, mm -hmm. and other uh, Slavic areas in Russia, and, and pardon me, in, in Europe to work in those countries. And, um, and and local people are saying, wait a minute, these people are different in our communities. So do they, you go over and No, no we don't go over there. Okay. We have a conference and that we put on for the law enforcement that monitors all these groups in all these other countries. They come to see us and we hold an annual conference. Or, and they, we've been there. To, we've gone there, too. We exchange information. And, uh, and it's a problem because, it's, you know, it, we always live in a world of us's and them's. And the, the, the us's over there or the people, and let's say Sweden has got a problem now, and, 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 and uh, Norway's got a problem. People are coming in, and they have good health care. They've got good benefits. And they say, wait a minute, these people are coming in, and they want to take some of our benefits away. So that's the them. So it's always going to be an us and them. And, and I don't know the rights and wrongs in their situations, but it, it, it is an issue when uh, I know in particular in, in France and Germany you have a, a budding neo-Nazi group, that young people especially who are, who are opposed to these immigrants. So when you look at the landscape now, let's just say in America, with uh, hate groups, we have about a minute left. Um, I know many are moving to western Montana, which is near here. What's your, what's your sense of the viability of these hate groups in this country right now? Are you, are you pessimistic, optimistic? Uh, you know, well, should I'm, we be worried? I'm extremely optimistic because law enforcement is much better educated. Mm -hmm. We do conferences. But they are also doing a lot more yeah. Uh, surveillance of everybody. <laughs> yeah, they, but that's true. But they also are much more aware of, of hate groups and the dangers they pose. They don't just take them for granted like I think people did the Aryan Nations when they first got started up here. Uh, and and I, I think America is going to solve these issues. These hate groups are small numbers, fractional number of our people in our country, and uh, but they're dangerous and you have to watch them. We don't want any more things. But there have been many more acts of domestic terrorism in America since 9-11 than, uh, than people would imagine. You've got the sovereign citizens group who've killed a large number of law enforcement. So we're, we're, still, we're monitoring them very closely. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me again. You're welcome. All these years later, I'm going to say we look the same. Well, thank just you. Just for grins. <laughs> my, my hair was, uh, wasn't gray back then in that picture. Mine, but, mine neither. And I was so. glad to see that, that news clip. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Morris Deese, the founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center. For more information on the center, as well as a link to The Color of Conscience, a documentary I produced about the case against the Aryan Nations, please go to the Dialogue website. Just go to IdahoPTV.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho.